Oh. Okay, she's all yours. All right, and we're going to put this one down. All right, how many people read Scientists and went, oh my God, she's just going to PowerPoint us to death? <laughs> Nobody. Oh, beautiful. You know where you are. <laughs> Applied Improv. Wonderful. It is an honor to be here. Um, I actually wanted to start with just a thank you. How many people have been um, improvising for a, a while? Let's just say a while. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. How many people feel like they've been doing applied improv for a while? Excellent. Thank you. How many people are like, you know what, this is still brand new to me? Excellent. Excellent. And my, I'm really, I went so fast because I'm so interested in knowing. I actually want people to be able to see each other as well in this. But I love technology. I love science. I'm an inner geek, even if people don't know it. Love you. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my God. Science was the worst thing ever. I can't believe I ever had to take a class in it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes to all of that. Um, I wanted to start. I'm already starting. I'm going to have multiple starts. I use that line all the time. I want to start. I want to start. I want to start. I'm really interested in why people decided to come. Thank you for coming. You had a lot of options. I really appreciate it. This is lovely. I'm glad you're here, honestly. Um, but you chose this. You have questions. You have questions from being long-time improvisers, to being brand new, to being inner geeks, to like, I can't stand this. I want you to, in your bag somewhere, you actually have pen and paper. I want you to write down, we're going to use these later, just some of the questions that brought you into the room. Because a little later, we're going to have a panel, um, and Mia Anderson, who is commuting in from her home base of Brooklyn, is on the wonderful, timely, never late Long Island Railroad. Yes, so we'll have a grand appearance, and we will welcome her grandly when she arrives. Um, so go ahead and write down some of your questions, and I'm going to ask um, at the same time if there are maybe two or three people who would say, How, what are the questions that brought you into this room? Do you have a question that brought you into this room? And it may be not a question. Maybe it was like, you know what, I heard Raquel was really fabulous. She's amazing, and I just want to see her. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, similarly, I, I, I appreciate your um, sense of conviction and, you know, the, the thought that you are um, uh, interested in what you're doing. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I lead a research group at the University of Michigan, so Wonderful. I'm interested in Wonderful. Great. Research. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, hey, please. So I want to know if, and if there's anything you can give me to help in my science classroom. With sixth graders, yes, Carolyn is excited. So we're going to ask that question again during the panel. So um, creating the human face of science, what a topic, right? So part of the question is when you think of science, what are the faces you imagine, right? Is it the hundreds of colleagues that look like me? Right? Those are my computing scientists, my black women in computing. What does it mean to create the human face of science? Is it, is it our countenance? Is it our demographic? Is it gender? Sure, it includes that, but is that all of it? So I want to invite you into this journey that I took, that little girl, to becoming a scientist, computational cell biologist, who's bringing improvisation and play to research institutions, to graduate programs, to professional societies, to scientists in pharmaceutical companies, or whoever will bring me in to play. Right. And I think it's a particular journey um, because I started it so long ago. And I'm going to go back to my thank you so that I don't forget. All the work that you applied improvisers and improvisers have done in the world made my work possible. Thank you. Thank you. Honestly. So we're going to spend like 20 minutes. 
I am going to go through <laughs> an academic routine, PowerPoint, um, just as prompts. Exactly. But I also I have a request. And I was going to gather you guys. So you guys have written down any questions that you had that you might have brought in? Keep them. Add to them. Again, I'm going to ask you to pass them in later. This is one of the things I do, at least at conferences, where people are sitting and they're not used to playing. And it's like you want to have interaction and, and they're shy because they've been looking at books all their lives for, you know, about 12, 15 years. Um, you write something and have them pass it in. Um, and I'm going to continue. So my, this is my activist journey to performance and building community in science. And I want you to ask questions as they come along. I've never presented to a room full of improvisers or people who want to be improvisers. I'm usually presenting to the person who's like, I think this is supposed to be good for me. Um, I'm not sure this is, why does anybody in science ever do this? Do we really have to? Does this work for me? That's who I'm usually speaking to. So I've had to do some work to change. You get to help me by asking questions along the way. Right. So I was born in the 60s, right? And I, I was thinking about this before I started presenting it, which is, it's emotional to say this now in a way that it's never been emotional to say it. In the same way that after the election in 2016, when I went to do a um, session on diversity and inclusion at Supercomputing, a conference called Supercomputing, I had to deal with that we're having a conversation of diversity in a room full of people who voted for Trump, who voted for Hillary, who voted for Bernie, who voted for Roseanne Barr, <laughs> right? And who were then going to have a conversation on diversity. It was emotional. How do you create that? So I was born in the 60s, and um, as a child, I grew up in the 70s, I wanted to be Martin Luther King, Jesus, or Gandhi. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. It may have something to do with the fact that I grew up um, in a mixed family, black, white. Uh, parents were poor, working class. Uh, mother's poor, white. Dad was working class, black. Who moved up to Sonoma County, California. Right? It was still residential, agricultural, just north of San Francisco. My neighbors were Hell's Angels. Uh, wealthy farmers, uh, welfare recipients, Native Americans, and us. Yes, exactly. Phew. Thank you for that. I say that because it's a very diverse grouping of people, and I am Sonoma County proud. Right? This, is, this is my John. John was a bellowing guy from upstate New York who would tell you that everybody was speaking a second language. And he would say it in this voice where you're like, oh my God, he's going to accost me. And he's like, unless you're speaking a Native American language, you're speaking a second language. Amen. And it's like, yes, right? Amen. But how did you have to hear him? Right? This is one of the guys I had coffee with. Sonoma County proud. And I grew up with people being, recognizing the failures, not because I was smart enough as this little kid, but I somehow knew the world wasn't right. Maybe it was because our family was still being torn apart, even though we had great, you know, sense of coming together. Maybe it was because my prom queen friend was still miserable. And I'm thinking, how are you, prom queen friend, having emotional pain when you supposedly check all the boxes? Right? I loved my conversation with Nina the other day. Because all this other stuff wasn't really going to go very quick. I didn't know about psychotherapy. Actually, we had a lot of mental health issues in our family. So I didn't trust mental health institutions. I didn't want to do that. The labeling of the poor and the black as mentally ill, not to mention the gay, is problematic. So that was not what I wanted to do. Um, but I wanted to be a scientist. How come? Well, I got to do this. Because it's like, here are these white guys. I can still get these white guys, Jewish, uh, Presbyterian, Protestant, atheist, Mr. Alton, my rugby teacher, yes, I played rugby, Mr. Kozak, who turned out to be a quartet player, who was the quirkiest, funnest biology teacher I had. So I wanted to be like them. So they inspired me, right? And so that was part of why I wanted to do a day job. And I wanted to say this because part of the politic that we develop around identity is that you have to be the same. 
And I don't believe that. It's not my experience. We can't all be the same. There's no way to be the same. I've learned from so many different people. The question is, how do we learn from each other? That's the politic that I bring to this. So I chose to be a scientist also because I wanted power. Yep, I wanted power. Science is in that position. You're all, who's looking to get science justification for their work? Right? Because it's the validating, legitimizing thing. And I knew, like, hey, when scientists say something, people listen. Well, I want to say some stuff to help make the world better. I want people to listen to me. I'm going to be a scientist. I also knew that science had done some bad things. Forty years of a syphilis study on the African-American community when they had a cure is a bad thing. That's how we now have ethical standards in our medical practices. Studying blackheads and white... Who knows this research? Okay, good, a good number of people. Most of my undergraduate, most scientists, a lot of students come up, don't necessarily know this history of the relationship of science and how the question of what's ethical or others, and yet they understand that this is possible, right? So in this case, good science of the time where black brains were, black people were dumber, not because of sociological segregation and not providing education. My grandmother wasn't allowed to go to school. It was because our skulls were smaller, right? So the mismeasure of man presented how we embed our uh, biases into our science. So again, I wanted to have power, I wanted to say what existed, and I wanted to help all of us, all of us, have something better in our lives. So I went to graduate school with that love. So, 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 hmm. So going to graduate school, who's been to graduate school? Yeah, all right. It was fun, wasn't it? You got to ask lots of wonderful questions. Yes? Yes? And, and you had lots of people respond and say, yes, and that's fabulous. Did, some people had that experience, actually. Awesome. Awesome. Lovely. Were you in a master's program, a PhD program? Master's? And a PhD? Wow. Excellent. Um, disciplines, just really quick. Okay. Excellent. So, so one of the things I say to my scientists, one, I do, I do this performance in front of scientists. Right? I love the audience. I'm saying this because I, one of the questions, is one of the questions in the audience, how do, what, how do you get scientists to do stuff with you? Right. I love them. I love them publicly. Right? Okay, I'm not having sex in a bathroom, I'm not having, but I love them publicly, right? That's a, that's a rare thing. Um, so, so we go into science, and we love stuff, and we're going to graduate school, and you're starting to ask all these questions, like, how can we give hormones to mice to look at how the eggs develop? How do we know that, that the way what we're studying from that is the same that happens in the body? Well, we've done it that way for years. Wait, but how do we know that what we're giving them actually is replicating what, we, what happens normally. Well, we've done it that way for like 10 years. That's how we do it. But, 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 right? So now, I think my advisor's honest answer was, um, I, it may have been a couple of things. It may have been like, you know what? I'm going through my family issues right now. I'm barely hearing you. I can't tell you that I'm having a hard time. Um, which I only discovered later. It may have been like, I don't know that I have a good question. Maybe that's beyond the scope. And really, I don't know that that's the question I need right now because we need to do the experiment. Those are all the backdrop that he couldn't figure out how to say in a conversation with his new student, who's a woman of color and he's an Italian white guy. Right? Anyway, all of this, I'm filling space. I'm going to keep going. I don't mean to fill so much. We end up isolated. Did you feel isolated in your... No, some, other than you wonderful people who had this great experience, which you should share with the world all the time of what it was like for you because we end up isolated, not knowing each other's experiences, right? So did others feel somewhat isolated or alienated? Yeah. So that's one of the trainings and things that comes up is how do I have this passion in these small pages... It's a little hard, right? So 
we're taught that you have to check your identities at the door, right? So many professional, this is not just science, so many professions develop an identity that says check who you are at the door. So for this guy, Kenneth Lamb, he's like, I'm an NFL football player, hey, you know, People know that about me already. What I love about this is he's smiling in both pictures. He's also a mathematician at MIT. He didn't check both. He has both, right? So the question is, how do we have all this? So there's a dis... <laughs> Lovely, right? So we check. We either check our other joyous... Who was surprised about the, the survey last night from the Alinalda? That, the, that it was joy and excitement was the number one. Right? Exactly. I was surprised as well, because we've institutionalized an identity that says, to be a scientist, you must talk like this, and so now I'm on to my next slide, and um, so I will we'll tell you about Lenore Filani, but, oh, wait a minute, I have to give you a thousand more details, and I'm not going to look at you, because really you're not supposed to pay attention to me, you're just supposed to pay attention to my data. Right? And this is, this is beautiful data. It has a round circle. In fact, it's not quite a complete circle, but if you check the diameter and the radius, what you'll see, <laughs> that's our training. It's a professional identity. It's institutionalized, and it limits us. It isolates us in the same way that graduate school does. I was fortunate. I met, and Barbara <laughs> heard about this one before, I met Lenora Filani. She was the first woman first black woman, first woman as an independent to be on the ballot in all 50 states for president. I was like, I heard about her in 1991 as I went to graduate school, and I was like, how did I, wait a minute, did you hear my background? How did, how did I not know of her? Because she was leading at that time a black-led, pro-gay, pro-socialist, multiracial, right, organization. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's kind of me. That's kind of me. I became, to my advisor's chagrin, <laughs> not only a graduate student, but a political activist, an organizer, a political organizer. Who went on the learning journey at the All-Stars? If anybody? A couple? Great. So the All-Stars is also co-founded by Lenore Filani. And the activity is to create the world together. One, we're already in the world together. We're, we already... The scares that we're having are because we're in the world together. Not all of us were in El Paso. We all felt El Paso. We all felt that. We're feeling the world. We are together. The question is, what do we want to create together? One of the stages I learned that on was on the street corner. There's a performance. Here's a stage. Hi, take a minute for democracy. Hi, take a minute for democracy. Inner voice. Oh, crap, this is really hard. I don't really don't want to talk to anybody. I wish I could go. Hi, take a minute for democracy. Hi, hi, take a minute for youth development. This was a performance. I learned about performance, right? And so, I, and I also learned that you didn't have to study to change the world because I thought I would change people's minds by studying things and giving them science facts and, and making all that good stuff happen. Instead, you had to engage in it. And I learned by producing the all-stars that if you could perform on stage... You could perform in life. How many believe that in this room? Exactly. That's the message that I take to scientists. You can perform on stage, you can perform in life. And that there's a world movement taking place, the AIN conference is part of it, where people are saying, I want to develop my compassion alongside my technology. I put our work in a world scope. Scientists have big dreams, right? I wanted my name on a star for a while. Right? Like that was the best thing. I'm like, I'm going to look. I'm going to put my name on a star. I'm going to find a protein, and it's going to be called Rock Hill's protein. <laughs> you know, like Lou Gehrig's disease? Hey, there was, you know, like what? Lou, I mean, Lou didn't like it, but <laughs> there are other things. There are other things that we find and we discover. We want to give the world we're aspirational, ambitious, right? But we've not taught how to be with other people. So I give them a big stage to play on, to make a small step in so that they can grow. That's my invitation consistently. All right, so I know I've been asking questions along the way, and I'm gonna ask, this is like, one of those, what is the time right now? 9.25. Goodness gracious, okay. We're gonna come back to this. Humanizing, because I don't, I'm, I don't wanna talk much longer. <laughs> How are you doing? Good, yeah, okay. 
as soon as you're like, okay, I need to stretch. Can everybody just do this real quick? Oh, you're lovely. Exactly, exactly. And as you feel the need to do that, it will help me know what to do. So you are invited at any time to do this, right? Because I will respond to you. <laughs> um, I do want to do this. Oh, back, sorry. Go back. You're sitting next to somebody you know, right? No? Excellent. Yoo-hoo. All right. I'm still going to do the stand up and talk and find somebody you kind you don't know as well. And I'm going to give you a direction. So as you're finding people. So here's so if um if you can just to hear the direction. So we Make the Road by Walking is um, a book by Horton about, of a dialogue between Miles Horton and Paolo Ferreri about their work in adult education. Always exist. And all of our work in many ways is walking into a space that doesn't yet exist. It's bringing together some passion of yours to where you want to be. Right? So I'm changing this question from how did you come to improv because we've been asking each other that <laughs> before the, for things. But how, what is it for you? I've been telling you my version of this. What is it for you that you want to bring of improv to wherever you're going? Or what is it of you that you think you want to bring to science? Or what, what is that combination that's, that's unique, that's a path that you're creating? Share that with your partner. Right? Go ahead. Yep. Ah. What is the what are you wanting to create? What's the new thing of bringing improv to something? Or, right? What's the path you're trying to carve? You're welcome. What's the path you're trying to create? And of course, make sure you're sharing the voice. When you feel like you're coming to a close, wave at me. When you feel like you're coming to a close, wave at me. Ten more seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. One. Thank you.
Thank you. Have a seat. Have a seat. What is it? What is it? What was that like? I got a lovely. A f- what? It was a little deeper. Deeper than. purpose or what you hope to get out of it starts with, here's how I started, here's what I want to go with, and that's what I want to keep people in. Yeah. And are peop- I'm assuming people are hearing each other, is that true? Yeah. No, thank you. Great, great, great. So it was, um, it was deeper, and it felt that, um, you know, it went beyond just the how I took a class and I found it in this logistical place, but rather where did I start from, and what am I wanting to go to as a path? I felt the, I, I really enjoyed the conversation, but I felt a little bit of resistance. And I'm not doing anything new. I'm doing stuff that everyone else is doing. I don't have anything that I alone am creating. So that was something that came mm-hmm, up. Mm-hmm. I don't have anything I'm creating new was part of that response. Please. So, um, it was nice to be able to state my vision succinctly. Oh. This, is where I'm, this is where I'm trying to go. This is where I'm trying to go succinctly. Go ahead. Oh, well, it was the first time I took it to the vision instead of just the process. Martha? It just felt more conscious of the times that how it helped me shape the life and design of the experience and mm-hmm. um, actually start to make my path a little bit clearer. Mm-hmm. And it felt so good that you were both doing this because you really are all of it. Um, it helped me make me feel more conscious of that. Mm-hmm. Well, do this seem simple in some ways? Well, I think sometimes we over-stylize what we're doing. We think it has to fit a particular look to bring it in rather than building with who's in the room and what's needed at the moment. And I think that's all of our passions of like being an improv. I'm, I'm going to say this, you can disagree, but like being willing to be changed in our directions. Right? This is not any. This is not the version of the talk that I imagined this morning. Aren't we glad? Right? Aren't we glad? But just those small changes, and I think that's what we're always working. That's what I'm always working to do is to help us have who we are, not in boxes, not in categories, but in a way that we're human with each other in our hopes. Oh my God, isn't that like that's emotional? I just get emotional saying that. Right? And, and again, if you're taught how to, to, to hide behind things so that you can narrowly focus on just what you're supposed to report, how are you to be human with others? So the work is using, is being improvisational. Also, improv helps us in our ability to be improvisational. Human beings are improvisational. It has to be there as an ability to be built upon. That's the beauty of what was created is that we now get to see more of who we are as human beings. And the work I do is to help us to be with other people, to be vulnerable, intelligent, and emotional. Nobody likes to go into a box and be by themselves, right? Unless you choose to be, and then there's a whole thing. You choose it rather than being added to you. So that's the structuring. That's the culture change we're working on. And it's the beauty of what the Alan Alda Center has done in that by the need, scientists need to talk about their work with others. They may not always like it. Like, we don't like the, the view that um, <sighs> our beautiful speaker yesterday, somebody helped, thank you, Pablo showed. None of us like that, right? But we were like, I got to go show up to this conference I don't want to go to because I got to promote my work and I got to talk about it. So will somebody help me talk about my work so people are interested in it because I love my work? I've spent my lifetime to get here to produce it. I love it. I want to share it with people, but I can't use that voice. Could you help me to like just communicate a message, not make it too small? You know, like I just I want people to understand. It. I don't want to have to dumb it down. Right? That's what we say. Right? So the beauty of the work is like using what they need. Somebody Gary Hirsch said this the other day. What are they looking for? What are they needing? And meeting them. To, to bring the improv. So again, I go back to my thank you. Thank you for giving me a tool to introduce performance. 
I was learned performance. Hi, take a minute for democracy. Hi, youth development. Performance transforms lives. I learned it in this grand performance, not from theater, other than theater in our lives. And improv, 1996, performance of a lifetime. Cat's book coming out. But the work going into the corporate setting was like, ha, ha, ha. I've got it. I can use improv, which is used for executives and corporate settings and for this like really high-powered stuff to give us ambitious scientists something to do. Do we like it? Does it help us? I don't know. And actually mostly, so the improv was the tool. My ambition was, is the stuff that I'm learning from grassroots organizing, youth development helpful to us? I don't know that it is. That's a nice you know, arrogant thing. I'm kind of arrogant at different points, but I didn't, I wanted to be an organizer. It's like, is it helpful for us? So Ori alone, I'm just gonna, just gonna have to go find Ori in Israel. <laughs> Ori alone and I talked at Cold Spring Harbor just down the street, and I said, I wanna do improv with scientists. He's like, great, come up to Harvard and let's do a workshop, right? Because we're colleagues in that way, it's systems biologists, computational biologists. So I asked the question, is it helpful to us? And they said, yes. It helps us see each other. It helps us be more comfortable. It gives me an opportunity um, to not worry about what I have to say. Oh, I've never paid attention to what my body or somebody else's body was doing. Like, that's a thing? But I started playing and asking people around me, can we play? This, this is a supercomputing conference. These are engineers. These are hardware people. These are all the data scientists or data scientist-like groupings that you're talking about. And there, what, what um, a colleague of mine, Dion, at Google said, he's like, you don't realize how those simple things you do are so powerful to us because they get to be seen. So people knew this thing about Raquel. She loves performance. She loves building community. And there was an NSF grant, National Science Foundation grant, that was at the time, it was called Creative IT, Creative IT, and it was looking at innovative uses of, and it's mainly around design thinking, arts, visual design. This was, again, this is 2010, 2009. And my friend's like, you've got to apply for this grant. This is all about you. So I got a grant called uh, Improvisational Theater for Computing Scientists. I wrote a grant, and it was awarded. That's the proper language. Um, and I went around the country giving talks, at, doing little bits of exercises, saying, again, what do you think? And then people, and I met people who were doing similar or related things. And I was like, we got to get together. I had some money. I said, let's get together. We got into Farmington, Connecticut in January, the best time to go to Farmington, Connecticut. <laughs> yes, 40 people came. 40 people came and um, shared about their work creating virtual worlds simulated worlds in which kids and adults could interact and do something perform computing clubs where people were were kids who were from community colleges as Contra Costa College were actually doing um, <laughs> it's a simulated mathematics and I can't even it's like you're doing computer mathematics but uh, but they're do they're being related to as capable beyond themselves performing something other than what they're related to or who they are Kathy Salin in her thing um, in the video said, there's this thing of history where there's both your past, your present, and your future. It's historical. What is it for working class kids to be given high class education in the sense of all the resources putting there? That's a transformative experience. It's a performance in life and in the world. I was meeting those people and I said, you gotta talk to so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so -and, -so. and we got together and then they said, oh, so we're gonna do this next year, right? I was like, eh. As they got together, they met each other, they were inspired, they created new collaborations, new projects. They played, we played. You're getting a rare performance of, of Raquel talking so long. But um, we all played. And so every two years, cultivating ensembles, the name was chosen intentionally. Do you hear ensembles? Do you guys ever heard that word before? It was the, it was the word that linked between the theater person that I was working with and myself like the improv, because she didn't relate to being an improviser, she related to being a theater director, uh, experimental theater, but ensembles, cultivating ensembles in STEM education and research, and we come together every two years, and it brings together people like Praneet uh, Namburi, who's a neuroscientist, who uses dance to inspire his research. 
and his research to inspire his dance. Right? So with all of that, these beautiful people who come together and learn the things about cultivating ensembles, I feel like I, this is one of those slides where I was like, do I actually need to say this slide to you guys? Because this is something I think we have, right? Um, but again, it's this activity of inviting scientists to build community in a way that supports them developing. And from there, you get these things that are leadership capacity, communication, team building, emotional intelligence. But it's something that we co-create, and we're invited to co-create. That um, what Alan Alda said uh, last night about we have to include the intellectual because that's part of who we are. It's part of the game. We love making intellectual games out of everything. That's the hardest part about leading improv workshops with science, at least for me. It's like we play a game and they're like, "Oh, did you see that pattern? Oh, okay." And they like, and the pattern went from this and, this, and then John did. And it's nothing about their. It's not the personal experience, right? It's just like, "Oh, there's that game." There's that science game, there's that math game, right? And so I'm in constant, my work is to help us get to feeling, right? And for me, this is an activism because there's something powerful when scientists say, what we need in the world is compassion. We can give you data too, but there's, there's something powerful in that. There's, there's, I want to hear, and then in our technical work, again, like what does it mean to bring it into our technical work? It's, well, how do I collaborate with you? You're speaking numerical methods, and I do, you know, it's, uh, and it's not, it. what is it, symbolic. It's, hmm? <laughs> well, it's actually the different mathematical simulation pieces where, like, so if you're doing, okay, geek speak, <laughs> if you're doing differential equation stuff versus, or it's populations and yada, 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 yada. Most of you don't care about what, that's, <laughs> I think I just said gibberish. Don't think I said jargon. What if I said gibberish? <laughs> right? <laughs> Differential equation, mathematics and supercomputing. No. That's right. Say it again. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, I lost my... Give me a prompt. Compassion. Compassion. Yeah, compassion for each other and compassion in the world, and our ability to love publicly. So I say, what, uh, people, I give a talk to scientists. I gave this at a um, LGBTQ uh, reception at the American Meteorological Society. And in that context, I said, one of the things about scientists is they are the S on the LGBTQIA, add an S because we love the weirdest things. They're small, they're large, it's kind of queer. It's awesome. <laughs> and we all need to come out publicly about what we love. So the exercise that I did before, again, is that invitation to like, how do we give what we love and invite people into that journey with us and learning to make each other look good. It transforms how we work. So why do I say performance, play, and creativity? Because our science is informed to each other, and to connect, like to give. I don't usually use the connect word, but to give who we are in this more public way. Um, and that's what I wanted to give you before inviting to this stage a panel. And the reason I'm inviting a panel, just Carolyn and Mia may be here, she's still. The Long Island Railroad has been unkind but you may still arrive. Anyway, that is the story of Raquel's journey as an activist to doing improv with scientists. And then we'll go into the, the panel, but I want to like wrap up that part of it and then we'll do the questions. Um, and why scientists are turning to improv is because they know that there's something to give, again, both about their stories to the world and to be inviting people into their work and to not be alienated from one another and to be able to collaborate with each other. That's, that's why we're doing that. And there's hundreds and thousands of people doing it, really. Thank you. Before I invite Carolyn up, are there any, what do you need? Ugh. 
questions, response, stretch. Go ahead and stretch while you do that. I know, because I need to stretch. Yeah. Cat. Great. So, what did, did you hear some of what I, how did you, so say? Mm -hmm. So the game that I created as we were doing this talk is one of the things I do with scientists. So I create this, I give who I am, and I say, I want to invite you to give who you are in a similar way. And so I create an exercise that says, and I loved that um, Aretha Sills said this, of the challenge of what it is to play with. So I work very hard to get out of the chair. I, work very, I, am, I am one of the most playful people in the room, I think. Marion, you're in the room with me in these contexts. But so it is the, the delight, the discovery, the questions, the not knowing what we did I'm doing that in every exercise. And so, um, otherwise, it's like synchronized clap in an auditorium, right? It's, um, I'm going to borrow, um, do, it's, ah, do people know the synchronized clap? Ah, some do, some don't. Excellent, here we go. So, and this will be another, so I'm, we're here, so here's a synchronized clap. So, go ahead and stand. Put your stuff down. And you can be where you are, but you might want to get closer, even within a row, with the people in your row. Move close, make your rows like this a bit. Stay in the same rows. Just stand. Excellent. So, synchronized clap. The synchronized clap is when you take a single clap. It's going to start from this side of the row. And that person is going to turn to the person next to them, and they're going to clap at the same time, right? So, um, Marion, where'd you go? Oh, your partner. People got an idea of what I'm saying. I was going to get up some. So, so you're doing, and you're going to clap at the same time. After that happens, you continue to pass the clap down the row. Turn and pass. Go ahead. Yeah, they're going. They're fine. And focus on, Mia, you're in it as well. <laughs> Great. And then pass it back, exactly. So you're just a synchronized, exactly. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> and back and, ex and scene. Give yourselves a round of applause. So we might play that for, and um, it's so interesting. Do you know what? I think there's always this underestimation, like when you have this experience of people know something that you forget that actually we need to continue to play, right? And so thank you for that invitation and the prompt um, on the synchronized clap. And so that very simple thing, again, getting people together to create together um, is one of the activities that I'll do in a large auditorium. It depends on the goals of what we're doing. So um, part of, I, so I, one of my funny lines is, how do you feel? I swear at scientists. I use F words and four letter words. How do you feel? Was it fun? Play? Game? Um, <laughs> right? Four letter words. Um, because the conversation is the focus. It is their changing their understanding of what it is they've experienced. It's how together from that experience are they experiencing, what do they think about what the other person felt, things like that. Other people wrote down some questions as well, right? Yes, let's collect the questions at this point. And is there another question burning at the moment? Yes, please. Yeah. Anything you want to tell us, take us through? I just like to get the 
You would like recipes. You like recipes. Excellent. I gotcha. Um, no, no, no. Who else is looking for recipes at the moment? So this is the challenge. All right, and, and, and some people who know me well can help me with this. The reason I talk about we make the road by walking is because it's very difficult to have recipes, although there are many good exercises that are out there, and I have a resource, and I'm happy to share different things that I've done, but I've borrowed from everything that you do. And I think the part that's hard and the, the part of the reason that people do look at the training and train the trainer activity is it's a question of how are you bringing you in the midst of those recipes, right, in the exercises. So at this moment, as we've got the cards, I would like to invite to the stage Carolyn Silfen and Mia Anderson. Please give them a round of applause as they come up. Wonderful. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, so this is the reason I wanted to do And other people, yeah. <laughs> One, I build community, and these are my colleagues in building community. So again, another round of applause for them. <laughs> also, because what it means, again, whether recipes or other activities, how we come to this question of um, bringing improvisation or performance to science is very different. We come from very different backgrounds, and part of the work is to have, again, this multiplicity of voices in what we're doing and different responses. So um, I'm going to do a very short intro and then ask you guys to just add to your introductions. Um, so Mia Anderson is phenomenal. One, <laughs> she's phenomenal. She is an actor, she is a director, she is a writer. I have known her for a while, um, and I met her as she was producing what I call community theater, but importantly for me, she was producing theater that required directing and developing people who have never acted, right? And, it's a, and she's a beautiful, loving, caring director, right? And improvisational in that. Um, shall I go there? At, would you like to add to that who you are at the moment? Okay, okay. Hey, Karen, thank you. Car Carolyn Silfen is a theoretical cosmologist. I love that. I love that. And a performer, and one of the people that I look to for talking about how we do compassion in science. She is an educator, she works in the universities, um, and is part of the physics community. So we all, again, we have different out locations to this. Mia Anderson, again, is in New York, both acting in, in, in films and producing your monologue, um, which, which is beautiful and fabulous. Um, and do you want to, would you add to a little bit of who you are? Whatever you want to choose. So, so one identity that I think might resonate with the room is I'm a collaborative learner, and I found that to be uh, rather unique in, in, in theoretical physics. And I think that's part of, been part of my journey um, into focusing more on facilitating learning and to coming to AIN. Um, so growing up, I was uh, very frustrated with how science was often taught and watching um, watching the natural curiosity that all children are natural scientists, watching it be crushed in my classmates. Um, so there's that fuel as well. And then um, getting to grad school and uh, realizing that some of my professors didn't understand what I meant by collaboration. <laughs> You know, oh, you want to collaborate. Okay, you do this, I do this, let's talk at the end of the week. Um, <laughs> and, and it wasn't that they were trying to, you know, not trying, they were trying to be helpful, they just didn't understand what I meant. Well, so, hmm? um, so how about, how is it that um, you came to the science work? Let's go there. Instead. And again, so just to give you a context, is what some of the things, so I gave my whole journey from like childhood in Sonoma County and Martin Luther King and 
uh, wanting to, you know, make the world a better place and how fabulous that is and, you know, scientists need to be part of creating compassion and that the AIN community has been part of leading the work that I bring in as well as, of course, the work with Fulani and things like that. And they did a little bit of games just to give you a Yes, you're welcome. Um, so um, I am not a scientist. Um, not, 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 not. Was not interested in science in school. Never, oh, never, oh. never. A everyone's a scientist at some level. Really? <laughs> okay, I'm a scientist when I'm putting together my face serums and like, <laughs> then I'm a scientist. Yeah, so like I'm outside at, no, not very yeah. much so. So how I came to this work actually is Raquel, is through our friendship. Um, she approached me when, um, about working with her with Improv Science um, because of the work I did with Drag King Sluts and Goddesses. Yes, that was the name of the show because that's the kind of girl I am. So, yes. um, but yeah, it was called DKSG and it was a 14 woman, um, ca women of color cabaret troupe. And so when uh, uh, Raquel approached me about uh, working with Improv Science and we sat in a Starbucks one day and we came up with the first curriculum for um, the first professional presentations. Yeah. And it sort of developed from there. So Starbucks was our friend. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So going to some, the, one of the questions that we have here is, um, what can be done to make science cool and appealing to youngsters? According to you, what can we do to move science, to, to move scientists or help embrace or incorporate improv this is multiple ones, so I'm just getting them out here. And do we get scientists, how do we get scientists excited about science communication? And how can something drive science? How can art drive science? I think these are all really good questions. And I'm going to ask, I'm, I'm not good at taking cues. So I'm going to ask you to say the time out loud and when we end. Do we have like half an hour? Yep. Left, so do you want us to give you a little? Yes, okay. that'd be great. Yep, perfect. Thank you. Yay. So I think well, let's play with these questions. Yep. Um, so I guess the one of them kind of feel, and then we also had the question about the, the sixth graders. Kids are natural scientists, I think. And so giving them the ability to, there, there's a lot, I see a lot of parallels between um, improv and the scientific method. Um, the sci or, uh, certainly the first part of the scientific method where we're ob observing, right? We all observe. And so just having kids observe and look for patterns. And, um, you know, talk to me afterwards if you want to know specific patterns. Um, I'm a big fan of um, Eugenia Kina at Rutgers and the investigative science learning environment. Um, so they, they're, she's got a bunch of specific observations that um, and she has, it's mostly at the high school but, and university, but she also has some at, for younger. Um, and so you observe specific things that have patterns that, that, and then let the kids observe that and then, um, okay, what could possibly explain those patterns? And generate all the possible explanations you can come up. Don't, don't get out of the head of dirt, right? <laughs> like don't try to be right. Just what could explain that? Um, one of the answers that threw her for a curveball that um, one of her university students gave her was, uh, it was, you know, you put alcohol on a blackboard and you observe what happens and it goes away. And so one possible hypothesis that, that the curveball that a student threw at her was, well, it's alive and it walked off. And so then that was, that was when she had a gun before. So she, you know, okay, so how could we test that hypothesis? And so it's, there's a creative process there. Okay, um, how could we test that? Here are some materials. How, what are, let's design an experiment to test that. And uh, the prediction is, okay, it, you know, if this, this, this idea, this wild idea is true, and we do this experiment, then what would we predict would happen? Did that happen or not? You know, if not, then, well, maybe our assumptions were wrong, or maybe that model is wrong. If yes, then... How do you um, see that as improvisational or the improv, or do you? Uh, because to generate those ideas is a... It's, it's you're playing... I guess your partner is nature, right? You're playing with nature. Does that...? Um, and so you're... 
you need to be in that creative frame of mind, which so often gets in science class. Mm -hmm. Good. I was thinking from there as well, um, what it is to do the warm up. Who came for the warm up? Right. Like how that plays into what you're talking about, or do, how do you think about warm ups or games in the context of the environment of asking those questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, so, um, and this is why I'm here and eager to learn from all of you, <laughs> why I've been so grateful to learn from, from Raquel. Yeah. Um, uh, it's often really hard to get students to start to do this, right? It takes some time because they come in, especially a lot of my students are, are pre-medical students. You know, they're very, very focused for, and very used to, you know, what do you want me to put down? You know, how, how am I supposed to test this idea? You know, what possible explanations am I supposed to write down? And so um, to create a classroom culture uh, that allows students to be playful and curious and get back in touch with that childhood wonder and curiosity of how does this stuff work? Yeah, um, yeah improv games, warm-ups, et cetera, can be very helpful for that. So two truths and a lie I've used it with undergraduates just as a way of having people talk when they wouldn't talk otherwise and then having all of the things on a board so that then you could talk about them, right? Making things public as a way, of, because otherwise we're just trying to get it right, as you're saying, is one of the games that I play with. I'm working on that, what are the recipes or what are the games people play as we're responding? So that's why I inserted that, yeah. That sounds lovely. Mia, do you have a, one of the questions that you want to? <clears throat> sure, how art can, what was the question, how art can? Uh, art can drive science. Art can drive science. So, um, well, I'm going to use like a, a, a sort of example, and it seems like I may be getting away from the subject, but just stay with me. So I think of the film Hidden Figures, and um, after seeing Hidden Figures, um, the excitement that I saw, <laughs> even amongst my own friends, mm -hmm. you know, who are, you know, a little older than undergrad, and, um, but who, the, the excitement, like we were like, oh my goodness, we want to be Katherine Johnson, and we want to put up, a, we want to put up formulas on the wall, and we want to, and we want somebody to come to us and like really need us, and you know, I mean, like who wouldn't want that? And I think so. I bring that up besides the fact that they were fabulous mm, women, mm. Um, but I bring it up because I there is something accessible in that, and I think that the challenge of science is that science is seen as something inaccessible. And knowing, I was very, I was fortunate when I went to school in New York, I had a very comprehensive black history program. So I came out knowing more than just George Washington Carver. But, I, you know, I know Cheryl Jackson, and on and on and on. But um, I know that's not the experience of everyone, unfortunately. And, but having that background, it gives a choice. And I think being able I think that the stories, like there was a, a, a show that came out um, this year at the Ensemble Studio Theater, and it was about, I'm going to say again his name, um, the, uh, the um, father of uh, OBGYN. Um, oh, uh, uh, he had a statue OB of him. Wong? No, no, OBGYN. No, OBGYN. Huh? No, uh, I know, right? Make up time. Yeah, um, but he, uh, he, they have a statue of him. So anyway, he did his experiments on slaves. Yes, exactly, black women. And so, um, and you can imagine, there wasn't concern for anesthesia. So, because, uh, and, and on and on and on. So anyway, I tell that story because that show was hugely successful. And it not only brought up to light the um, uh, the inequalities in our medical system, which I, I can't assume that's a shock to anyone, but also in terms of the understanding of science and how the use of science and the care of science and how in terms of either being an ethical scientist or not being an ethical science, but that came through art. And I think there's a way that art is able to reach people um, for better or worse reach people in a way that other forms cannot. And I actually think it's imperative that we bring art into, in, into the conversation about science. Because my philosophy, as I always share with uh, Raquel, is 
my concern with science is if scientists aren't telling the story, other people will. And we're noticing that that's what's happening. When scientists have to have a rally to prove that science is real, that's really problematic. So, and I think that there's a way that scientists ha can no longer be seen as something that's there and then the rest of the people are here. And this is like skilled workers and unskilled workers. I think that we can make that sort of connection that it is the discovery, it is the interest, it is, it is the curiosity that brings about the, the um, what is science? Because all science started with a question, right? Yeah. What if we can, what if this does, what if blah, blah, blah. And I think if we can keep that question, that openness, you know, and, 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 and in, in the conversation, and that's what art is. Art all start, um, my solo show that, um, that I wrote, the, uh, my first solo show that I wrote, um, started off in the question of, you know, like how can, why do, because uh, uh, Prince had just passed, and I was like, why do I love these artists who I don't know? You know, so it started from there. So I'm just saying, and so the germinating started from a, a question. And I think science is the same, same, exact, same exact way. And I mm -hmm. think if we can get back to that heart and really encourage that, the question, right or wrong, how the, yeah. what, what comes out at, from it, but just the question, I think will engage people because people want to be engaged. And I think, go ahead. Um, so I think that's a, it's one of those things, like it's a very valid thing. And there's, the, one of the, the work of the Alda Center has led to science communication as a thing. Scientists become science communicators, which means they get training in communication, right? And they then go on to take positions that are about engagement, policy, and so on. Researchers in the lab are interested in, I'm interested in my research, what's gonna advance my question, and so then it's how am I, do, does anybody else actually understand what I'm saying? Often what's true in a, in a research department is nobody else understands what's coming out of that lab. So they stand in a, in a seminar room and they talk about their work to people who supposedly understand and nobody understands it. The reason that systems biology pr program, the, the, the communication is they said, we have brilliant students but you can't tell. Right, and and they couldn't so and and all of it. And one of my favorite things, Mia, that Mia <laughs> asked a student, it was just it's just a question that you asked, which was um, the student was up there doing a classic performance of um, yeah, and um, ad, um, um, t so then the um, and uh, and how's this? And I'm like a classic scientist going, oh, he doesn't know his work, he just doesn't know what he's talking about. And Mia's like, do you know your slide? And he's like. Uh, well, and she's like, no, do you know what's on there? And he was like, yeah. She's like, okay. So, and I'm like, no, he didn't know. But he, I was like, why could you ask that? It's clear he doesn't know. But it was just that question, right? So it's about the supporting, the performance is supporting communication, being in community, being in relation. So all of my work my, is on developing people's ability to be in relation to others, and in that context, communicating their science to their colleagues, to their advisors, we're constantly asking them, who do you need to talk to? That's we're, The only training we're doing is in the context of what they want to be being trained in. So we're, all, we're only, that's, I mean, honestly, I think we say that like five times. No, no, it's not about us. It's not about what we want for you. It's, it's what do you want? What, what are you wanting to grow in? Because our work is demanding. The work that you do as improvisers is a demanding emotional work. And sometimes we don't understand how demanding it is. I think, that, like, it's, it's a shock. Like, to, to, anyway, blah, 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 blah. It's demanding. And so we ha only go where they want to go.
Oh, it's interesting. All of us, I think. Um, well, it, you know, I, I, improv is the best tool that I've seen. That's, that's why I'm here. <laughs> How so? Um, uh, what, 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 at least when Nancy and I work, work with, uh, work with fellow, scienti fellow scientists for me, um, we describe improv as a laboratory for human interaction. Right, so it's it's the it's um, a place to experiment with h different ways of interacting with people in a safe space. So, like, yeah, how do you get better at practicing compassion? Um, uh, part of that is empathy and understanding where other people are and what it's like to be other people in other people's shoes. And uh, improv lets you do that and lets you experience different situations in a well, safe space, brave space, whatever you want, but in, in, in a space where it's a lot less risky than the real world. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> well, again, not a scientist, but from my work with Raquel um, in uh, doing, doing this kind of work and agreed the improv helps to create that environment. Um, but I also think that part of creating Sometimes what I've experienced in working with some scientists is that as opposed to an art, in art you have to, like my job is to, if I'm doing a role, I'm doing a shoot, is that I, I have to always be observing people. I have to look at people. So there's most, uh, many of you I can sit here and, and look at and probably have a good idea of some sense of you. Not everything, but there's certain things that people do that you have to, while you begin to sort of pick up. And I think that what I've noticed with sometimes with scientists is there isn't, you aren't <laughs> required to take other people in. You aren't required to relate to other people. And so it is it's sort of you're invested in remaining in your own little um, uh, silo mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. And what I've noticed in the work that we have done, like one of my favorite, um, I always tell the story because he's m one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, there was a young man who had a serious stuttering problem in, one, in our classes. Yeah. Like he, like a really serious stuttering problem. And the, when it came, so how we, do, how we do the work is that every week, different people are able to come up and get coaching. And so he was his time to do coaching. And I, I remember talking to Raquel beforehand and I said, mm -hmm. let's leave a little extra time for him. So what I, what I did is I had people surround him and I had him talk to each person individually. And I said to them beforehand, we are here for him. Can you be here for him? If you can, it's okay. But we just can't, you know, we can't have you in a circle. But this, you know, can you be here for here? But, and so, and they were mm -hmm. amazing. They were amazing. He didn't stutter once. So I think that part of it again, and I don't think there's anything miraculous about that. I think that the reason is, mm -hmm. is because he was seen and they were seeing him. And I think that in this work, to bring compassion to this work is the responsibility of stepping out of your own comfort zone. Who cares if you don't want to do so? Who cares? If the point is that you need to communicate to another person, that has to be the attention and the objective. It can't be about like, oh my God, if I'm going to feel comfortable, I'm not going to do it. Then don't do it. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to step, you got to do the work, then do the work and be uncomfortable. That's one thing that I learned from Raquel. Be comfortable with being uncomfortable. You'll survive. You won't die. Mm. You know, it may be uncomfortable in the first couple of times. It'll be really uncomfortable. Before you know it, it gets easier and easier. Because people are just people. That's it. And everybody wants to be seen. You know, I'm, I'm a queer woman, and one of the things is I flirt with, well, one, I'm bisexual, but you can flirt with men, women, gay men. Nobody cares because all that flirting is is being seen. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. I think I wanted to add to that. Um, the, the focus of the work is building the ensemble. And I think people sometimes, and I actually had a conversation with another person who was like, that's often left out. It's a warm up to get to something else, right? And it's like, no, actually that is the work. The work is building the ensemble and they'll help direct where it needs to go. And one of the things about the approach, which I, that, so I'm trained in an approach called social therapeutics. I trained in order to help us grow emotionally because our worlds are messed up. I'm not messed up. 
right? I don't think anybody, like, we all have issues. <laughs> we may all be crazy, but I'm not broken. Our world is broken. So how do we create a space where we can be with each other? So that statement of being with each other, um, vulnerable, emotional, intelligent, is the ensemble, right? And that's the context in which Mia can give direction. So we're constantly, the first exercises that we're doing are paying attention to, are we responding to each other? Are we together? Do we have that smile? Are we, are we moving back and forth? Like we did, we, had, we did one class where that ensemble didn't exist and it was quite hell. Quite hell. Hell, 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 hell. Yeah. Did I say hell? Yeah. It was hell. Yeah. Right, where I learned like, oh my God, I never get to not be in the chair. I mean, to not be, at, you know, I always have to be here. I always have to be here. If I'm, if I'm going to ask you to grow, if I'm going to ask you to be uncomfortable, I have to be here. Right? And you can do that. It doesn't always have to be this. It's not everybody does my performance. So this conference, the Cultivating Ensembles in STEM Education and Research, which I founded, was chair. I'm no longer the chair. I was like, somebody else has to do that. And they're like, oh my god, we can't do what you do. No, you don't have to. But we can learn how to be with each other and respond and create community in which scientists are learning how to do games, to lead their classes in new ways, to do research differently. Praneet was at Kestimer. Sarah L. Shafee is studying with Rebecca Stockley. She's worked with Pixar and is teaching science communication using both you know, um, video and, and different improv games. And one of the things she said is, I used to teach anatomy, and uh, I actually, which is, I took the customer method, and I took it home, and I used it in my classes. And so before the class started, I would check in, and we did some games, and, and then we would go through the class. And then students started coming early, and then they started coming late, I mean, staying late. And then someone said, you know what? This is the best class ever. And she was like, said no one of anatomy class ever, <laughs> right? But it was this whole new thing of what was it to build the ensemble in which people are seen and being able to see others. And that's where the compassion is growing from. We, like, we're sticklers on that. So, other question? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. Love it. Yes, please. Mm. Uh, and my experience about five years ago, that changed. People were knocking on my door. Mm. Uh, what's, what's your experience with your interaction with your group of extra scientists, the whole works, as scientists? Are they coming to you? Are you going to their facilities? Are they deeper and interested now? Or are they still across the board? So I would say they're across the board. Um, and I don't know. But just to staying in this space for, right, is like the last five years, because we've been doing this now, since, just, no, no, since 2012, 2012, since 2012. But there's been a change that I actually relate to as part of the science communication publicity and public nature, which is people have experienced improv, and so they, but they, they're doing an improv class and they don't have it in the context of what it means to have it in their work. And so they're coming like, oh, I know what this is. Right? Like, they're putting it into a box right away. Oh, you're going to have me play a silly game. Quack. Like, that, 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 that duck comment didn't have to be an applied improv situation. That may have been an improv class where someone was like, you know what, I hate improv. Right? Like, just that didn't have to come from that context. So people are coming with a sense of knowing what it is. Um, which can be in the way of... No, it is in a way. Thank you. <laughs> it is in a way. Yeah. Of the debriefs that go on where we're actually exploring the feelings that come in with it and what is it to be in relation to one another because it becomes, oh, did I get the game right? Oh, I got to get this right. Oh, I got to get that right. So I think that attention to relationality is so key. Do people have a sense of what I mean when I say relation and relationality? So it's... When I, so just this question, just as concretely as I can, when the question came, I was going to go, hey, well, I got an answer, leaving out that I'm actually in relation with Mia and Carolyn on stage, giving expression to that we're doing this together, acting, working, speaking, that we're together in a way that, that gives expression to, not by words, 
that we're together. I think at least that's how I see relation relationality. And I don't know what else I was going to say about that, too. It's a change point. I feel like consciousness is moving in the right direction mm -hmm. about the importance of, of our work. Mm -hmm. Our work. No. I would say that um, still that the work, um, you know, there was one class we worked with where they had already done improv in the beginning of the year. Um, and they were phenomenal. They were so open, so mm -hmm. ready. Um, but I would say from my experience in terms of doing it as a person who's coming from an artistic background, um, I still find it is still a challenge. Right. It is still a challenge to work with and do this work with because of that sense of knowing and wanting to be right. And it so gets in the way um, of coming in and not I would say that one thing is like to again to bring about that compassion is is to have an openness because um, I think a lot of times and also I think part of it as well is because me and Raquel are two black women and we walk in and we're in uh, that is that's that's a rarity that, yeah, it's a in rarity. the context of where we're working so they always assume and it's and then especially when I get up there because I'm not a scientist that they're going to you know somehow be able to run me trust me they don't but um, <laughs> but they always assume they will. And I think because this is assumption in terms of the knowing and the knowing and the knowing and the knowing, um, and it really does impede. And sometimes it makes it um, it makes it not pleasant, to be mm -hmm. honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was thinking also the growth, so the growth of the AIN community, the visibility that is coming up, the recognition that there's something relational, something to learn about communication, collaboration that is part of what's driving like people have recognition that they need to do something around how their teams are working that they want to address and that they don't know how to do so so that's the part of the benefit like there's a strength with it being me and i and the context we're talking about is professional presentation coaching right yeah. there's again there's a different work that goes into leadership capacity group dynamics or overall career development it's all based on the relational work right so the games are only an, an activity to support us developing our ability to be in relation to one another. Yeah. Please. Oh, come here. I think it's something that we all struggle with in our careers and professional careers, even in family careers. How do we go from a one-off to come in and be given the resources that we need to assist in our professional lives? And how do we have a mindset to shift? How, how do you use that time and effort and energy from the things that you do I have a sense of that. Does anybody else want to? Oh. Do you want to? Do you, no? Do you, do you have a response to that? Or? Well, if, if it's in my classroom, then I have them for at least a semester is all I have to uh -huh. say. So the, on, the part of the ensemble is the what people say, and part of this is I'm in a location where I can hear continually hear feedback about what's going on, right? So part of that is, oh, they're talking to each other more, they're a close-knit group. Oh, um, so the first one-off that I did was uh, for Boston University was this retreat, right? And um, I followed up with Caroline, who's the director afterwards, um, but it was mainly for billing, but I was like, oh, I found out how come you heard about me. It was because we were working over at Harvard, and she's like, oh, what are you doing there? She's like, I know that, like, our kids came back. Everybody started asking for collaboration after they did that workshop. Everybody started asking for that, and so we want to do more of that, and so then it was just being able to say what it was that others were doing that was possible. So they don't have a language for what they're looking for, so part of the work is Again, hearing the offer. Oh, I'm looking for communication. That nobody knows what that means. It's a it's a buzzword. It's jargon, but you know you need it. It's the most transferable skill. But what is it, right? And we all mean it differently. Again, which is why I think it's important. Like, so what does that mean? Oh, oh, the, you know what they're saying? They need communication skills, but they're they're actually trying to figure out how to work together as a team. But their communication's broken down. Oh, um, okay, they need communication skills. There, you know, people are leaving because there's not a culture for them to have support, right? Like they're very, so that's the, the one-off is how do you have the relationship with the person who's bringing you in to continue to find out what's needed? 
And that's, so that's that work, I think, of getting the client work, is that relational work there. There's back, please. Far back. The last, uh, yes, yes, yes. It, yeah. mm. Mm. Yes. So the question is about the relation. And this will be our last question, so we'll belonging. go like this. Okay. Yep. That's what I was trying to capture the question. Yeah. yeah. What's your experience of belonging um, and the nuance of that? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's so integral to, well, the radical inclusivity of cultivating ensembles. Um, I, I kind of have a mixed feeling about the word belonging. Mm. <laughs> How so? Because it can, if you belong, then are there people that don't belong? Mm. But in the context of like this, it's, it's um, the I sense think. of of being a part of something that everyone can be a part of. And I feel like the, yeah, like the cultivating ensembles really helps with that and helps cultivate mm -hmm. that, that that is part of being in an ensemble, especially a radically inclusive ensemble. And um, yeah, it, it, I've often felt out of place in a lot of places, <laughs> uh, you know, either as a theater person in physics or as a physics person in theater or as a collaborative learner in physics. Um, so uh, yeah, it's been super helpful for me, this, the, the, the environment for growth that, that Raquel and collaborators, have, the, the cultivating ensembles. Thank you. Um, well, some of, I do feel like sometimes language is sometimes used as the way to, um, um, mm -hmm. I, don't know, I, I feel like in some ways it's, it's sometimes it's used as a way to, it's supposed to bring people together, but can sometimes actually create a little more divisions. And so what I mean by that is, um, because those are very like, sort of app words right now, you know, otherness and, and those sort of, you know, th that sort of language. But then when you really ask, it doesn't really mean anything. And I, I think, I will say that just for me. And so I, I, I guess the, the sense of belonging, I'm, I mean, I, it becomes so relative. But I think when we are working together, it is, again, never my concern whether I belong or not. Because the focus is on the students and the focus is on what they need in that moment. And so um, I think in the part of like creating, if there is a way to create a sort of belonging, it is in that way of, of trying to find where we are um, similar on something or how, again, back to how someone is being seen. And in terms of the work that we do, well, like when I'm working with or coaching someone during our sessions, it's really focusing on like listening to who they are and getting a sense of, of what they want. And I think when, again, when people are seen, when people are heard, there's a way that they respond and they're open. And, and, and sometimes it can be a little uncomfortable for them, sometimes it can be a little shocking for them. Um, but I think that is what really allows um, the, cre the in, in, in terms of the space that we have, because everyone, because there's never, there's no such thing as when the person is up there being coached that you're sitting back and chilling. Like that's not the way yeah, it goes. The audience is part of. So in this scenario, it's not that we are here on the stage and then you're listening and taking in my brilliance. So that's not what this is about. It's about a give and take and that we are responding and then you're responding back. And then it's all of us in this right. room together. Right. And so then you don't really have to get into that sort of conversation if it's just that sort of understanding. That's why sometimes when artists say like, you are a great audience, they really do mean that. That's not a joke. They really do mean that because a great audience is just receiving what the person's giving and then they're giving back. Right. That's it. You know? And so if you don't have that, 
if that's not happening, then that's when, when people feel isolated, it's because they're thinking of themselves. Because they're worried and they're thinking, you're judging me, you're judging me, you're judging me. That's when isolation sets in. When people are comfortable, the reason that Michael Jackson would be comfortable on the stage, yes, he was uber talented, but also he didn't feel isolated. He assumed, you love me, you love me, you want to see me, you didn't pay good money to see me. So, <laughs> you know, and so that creates yep. this. Yep. Thank you. Well, so my last comment as we leave, and that um, oh, we have to do one more thing. Okay, so so the part that I wanted to say, still in relation to this, is because the work I do is always focused on how do we create the context and the conditions in which we can be who we are, which is very different, to see each other, to be in relation to one another in a way that celebrates who we are and creates the conditions for us to grow. That is all, that is, uh, many times that's, that's all I'm doing. I learned how to do that through the Eastside Institute, through the All Stars, through my family, from organizing. I think this, I dub you all activists in the performance activist movement of bringing improvisation to the world in a way that people can grow and develop. It's a creative process. Whatever recipe I can give you, I will give you what I have. You will have to make it your own. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. So thank you to all of you for your, for your brilliance. Um, we have to do one more thing. You don't have to say this. Martha's going to come up and um, thank you.